in the end, being a caregiver is full of a lot of blessings, a lot of burdens, but overall, it's a gift. And I hope if you are in that position of being a caregiver, that you'll be able to step back and look at all of the things that you are doing that are a gift. And what you're doing for that person, the child or the parent or the grandparent, or the friend, that you just know that that is a gift to be able to be in those spaces and stand in the gap for that person who is really needing you. Friends, this is Lisa Roars with the Sunshine Cafe podcast, and I have a very special, quieter episode for you all tonight. This episode is in honor of my mother and in memory of her, and also is for all of you out there who have ever had the burden and the blessing and even the questions that come from caring for someone you love as they move through a chronic or otherwise life-consuming illness. This episode's for you. My mom wasn't married. She got divorced when I was pretty young. So she's all alone. We had a cremate and I told her I would put her next to her mom where she could be snuggled up in her mom's lap for the rest of time on this earth anyway. So I took the day and I drove a couple hours to a military cemetery where my grandparents are buried. I found those beautiful headstones amongst all of our heroes who have fought so hard for our freedom. And I gently laid her ashes there to be with her mom and dad. And the drive up and back was beautiful. It was a sunny day. It was quite cathartic. But a lot of what you're going to hear in this episode is from my drive and the things that surfaced in my mind as I was thinking about her and putting her to rest and kind of giving her her final placement of of, uh, a space at home. So if anything comes out sideways or doesn't come out quite right, I ask in advance that you give me the grace and the freedom to ramble and maybe not to say it perfectly, but I hope somewhere in the midst of this episode that there will be some beauty and some encouragement for you, and that it will be honoring to my mom. There are many burdens and blessings when you're a caregiver. There was many for me as my mom's caregiver. I had power of attorney and healthcare agent for that beautiful woman for almost 20 years. She passed peacefully into the arms of Jesus at the young age of 78, but multiple sclerosis had been taking her days one at a time. She lived with MS for 50 years. That's a long time. So first, I think we can, we can all agree that caring for a loved one is a long journey, difficult and beautiful in many respects as well. And it's hard to really understand it unless you've lived it, but those who have know exactly what I mean. There's kind of this constant feeling like you're not doing enough or that what you're doing might not be the right thing. The role reversal of a daughter and a mom happened a lot sooner than it should have, at least a lot sooner than I expected it to. My mom was diagnosed when I was around seven or eight, or at least that's my early memory. She may have had it long before that, but that's when I first remember her having issues. So sometime around then. And the role reversal of me really not being able to rely on her and instead needing to be the strong one so she could rely on me. That was completely new and foreign to me. It wasn't what I expected. I, I needed to mourn the loss of the mother I expected to have. It wasn't her fault by any means, but it was different than what a lot of my friends experienced and a lot of the stories I had heard about and experiences that different friends have had. There was certainly a healthy dose in my mind around what my life might be like and what my mom's life might have been like if she hadn't gotten sick. You know, she was so full of life and joy and energy and so vivacious and beautiful and talented and goofy, (laughs) really goofy. 
can't imagine where I got that from. But I always wonder what she might have been like if she had been able to live long enough to live that kind of life, thriving into her 70s and maybe even beyond. It's really enough to make you suspicious of everyone when you're a caregiver for someone like that. Because throughout all those years, you know, you're constantly wondering, are the doctors doing enough? Is the family doing enough? Is the facility doing enough? Is mom doing enough? Am I doing enough to help make this as successful as it could be or make her as healthy as she could be? With all there was to remember with her treatments and her everythings, it wasn't long before I became mom's external hard drive. I always told the doctors that. I'm here because I am my mom's external hard drive. Whatever you need to know, I'll give you the dates and the data. That was me. That was my role. So her medicines, her surgeries, her kidney stones, her medications, what dates she did what, and when she had her episodes for MS and all of that was all in my memory. (laughs) So much so that when I checked in for my own doctor visits, it was usually her birthday that popped out of my mouth first. And the looks on those administrators' faces when they tried to reconcile my face with my mom's birth date was a classic. (laughs) Ha, that's funny. If you are like me and you live in a family that has more than one sibling, so if you're not an only child, you might also, in a caregiving role, go through the questions that I went through like, does my brother know? Does he understand everything that I'm doing? Does he understand all the appointments and the interruptions from my job and all the stress and all the worry? And and I would wonder, you know, why is this all falling on my shoulders? Why do I have to do it all? But then in that same breath, I immediately would argue with myself and say, this is not a have to. This is a get to. This isn't that I have to do this. I can do this for her. I get to do this. And then I'd embrace myself for the guilt that would surely come right after that question of her, you know, not being a cheerful enough giver. I guess, you know, we all are human, but when you're a caregiver at some points or maybe at multiple points, you end up asking yourself, am I doing what they would want me to do? If the roles were reversed and they were able to to be this healthcare agent and power of attorney person, would they do the choices that I am making? Was mom happy with the choices I was making on her behalf? I hope so. Wasn't always confident about that, though. And I wondered, you know, how long would would it last? How long would she be like this? I was caregiver and power of attorney for that beautiful soul for close to 20 years. I didn't know if she'd last six more months, a year, five years, 10, 20. She was only 78. I thought certainly she could live till 88. But then, you know, I felt guilty again for even asking myself that question. I wanted her to live. I wanted her to live her life every single day of it and to live it with vitality and in a very honoring way and to die whenever God was ready to take her home, but be able to do that with dignity. There's so many days when I had to ask myself honestly, is she living with dignity? Is that what living with dignity looks like? Is that a life that's thriving and is she enjoying life? I couldn't answer that question with confidence ever, really never. I think so. I think she was enjoying her days. She was always so content. She made everybody feel comfortable and brought joy to everybody around her. So I think she was doing what she wanted to and living with joy. There'd be moments where I would catch myself kind of wondering, is this my destiny? Is this my future? Am I destined to get MS or some other kind of autoimmune disease that is so debilitating that my son has to take over for me and make decisions for me? Is that what I have to look forward to? Gosh, I don't know. It certainly has made me more aware of health and how important our health is. And it's part of the reason I'm doing this podcast and the digital courses that I do, because I'm really passionate that it doesn't need to be my future. The more that I learn about health and the more that I learn about how much what we eat and what we surround ourselves with affect how our genetic code even decides to turn on or turn off, 
the more confident I am that I do not have that as my future, but certainly as a question. The beauty that I had being her caregiver was having time with her. I learned things about her that I never would have, ever, if I wasn't sitting waiting for doctor appointments for hours and hours at a time or meeting her for a driver to pick her up in her wheelchair and watch how she responds under pressure, which was beautifully, completely joyful and content always. Now that's an example to live up to. I never would have appreciated all that she did in her life if I hadn't had the burden and the blessing of being her caregiver. The blessing of being her caregiver has really been to see and realize all the ways that I'm like her (laughs) and all the gifts that I have from her learning from her often in what not to do, but also often in what to do. There's a lot of things that she did that I chose to replicate. And there's quite a few things I also looked at and said, I don't want to do that. One of the biggest burdens of my heart is that our son will never know the joyful, beautiful, energetic, healthy, vibrant, classy woman beaming with talent and a smile that lit up the room, servant-hearted leadership that my mom had. She was a complete package. The blessing is that I know exactly where mom is. She's in the arms of Jesus with a brand new body that isn't weighted down by the chains of MS or any other burdens that this life here on earth offers. She's free. She is free and she is in the beautiful presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus. The legacy that she leaves, well, there's a lot of them. But one of them that I'm working on right now is a children's book that she wrote, really a poem, a children's Christmas book that will hopefully be out by next year, 2024, Christmas. I'll do my very best to share with the world the beautiful way that my mom crafted words on a page to come alive in a way that hardly even a picture was necessary because it just sprung to life with the words that she chose and how she crafted them together. The world, or at least some of it, should have the chance to enjoy her craft. The burden over these last 20 years or so has been immeasurable stress. Calls in the middle of the night to take mom to the ER. Notifications early in the morning that they called a ambulance to bring her across the street to the ER. And then the bill that came with that, which was four figures, (laughs) to take her across the street. But there's regulations, things they do for a reason, I'm sure. Paperwork. Oh, my goodness. The paperwork that I had to take care of for mom, pages after pages of pages that I didn't even understand most of the time. I don't know how somebody elderly or somebody with failing mental clarity would ever have figured out county forms and applications and rules and regulations and dollars that had to be managed and trying to keep track of mom's spending and her being oblivious to it her being so vulnerable to scams and being taken advantage of left and right. And just that frustration that I couldn't warn her or protect her from it. Stressful. The burden, frustration, even anger from watching mom's health diminish and not seeing her fight or try. Maybe she was, but from the outside, it looked like she was just surrendering to whatever MS wanted to do, and she wasn't fighting to keep her body strong. So that was a challenge for me to keep my own anger and will in check. She needed to live her life, not my life. She needed to live the way she wanted to, not the way I wanted her to. In being a caregiver, there's a burden of wondering what dreams she had that she never got to see fulfilled. You know, she was always content, but I always wonder on the other side of those beautiful brown eyes of hers, what thoughts and dreams she might have wanted to accomplish that she didn't get a chance to do. I have a burden of six bins of hers, six of these enormous 24-gallon bins, you know, something you go buy at the store and store away your Christmas decorations. I have six of those full of her journals that date all the way back to when she was 16 years old. Notebook after notebook, page after page, line after line of her dreams and tasks and things she completed and hopes she complete and what she wore that day, (laughs) who took her out and what movie they went to see. And wow, 
I had permission from mom to look through those. And I did take the oldest one I could find, the one from her 16th year on this earth. And I read through a little bit of it or kind of skimmed over it. And, you know, I decided after looking through some of it that while I might find out some really amazing things about my mom, her dreams and the questions that I have, I think it's better to leave those questions unanswered. And I think it's better to just love what I know of her and whatever questions are remaining to leave as perhaps something I'll find out when I get to heaven and get to see her again. So I think for now, well, I think forever, I'll leave those books closed. Those will be her thoughts that she was able to vent into her pages of journals. I know in the ending days, in the last many years, those pages were filled with things like, Lisa called, Lisa stopped by, doctor appointment Tuesday, watched a show. <laughs> so they were very um, in the moment kind of things. The biggest blessing that I got from my mom, of course, is life. She chose to have me. She could have aborted me or used birth control and not had me or otherwise decided not to have me or raise me or have me adopted or something. But she, in the midst of a very difficult marriage and a divorce that was already on the horizon, she chose to have me and let me live. Wow, what a beautiful gift that is. And I do not take that for granted. I will use my life as best I can to be worthy of the honor of simply having it. That would be a good goal achieved if I can do that. I am over the moon excited that my mom knew Jesus, who was the most perfect spouse and kindest dad and most perfect high integrity man you could ever ask for. So she knew my Lord and Savior, but I'm sad she never got loved by a man like that. But she's loved by the one that really matters, and that's Jesus Christ. I'm burdened by mom, knowing that she did her very best. But I also have a little bit of anger still that I need to work through, kind of feeling like she could have protected me or taught me things that she didn't. Many of the lessons I learned from her were things I said of what not to do. But learning to let go is, is a challenge for me that I have to just work through. She could have taught me better. She could have helped me protect myself better. She could have protected me more from some of the pains and abuses I had as a child. But I have peace knowing she did the very best she could with what she had at the time. And I know she was dealing with a lot of things, burdens and blessings probably too. One of the biggest blessings is I'm just so proud of her, how much she accomplished. As a daughter, I got to see my mom take her first step again. She lost all of her feeling in her left side in one massive MS flare-up and went through months and months of rehabilitation to learn how to walk and dress herself again and just take care of herself. And peeking around the corner of that physical therapy space in the hospital, I got to watch from the sidelines. She didn't know I was there, but I got to watch her take that first step. I, I remember just doing a big happy dance for her. I'm so proud of her. And I was so proud of her when she went back to school, finished her degree, and didn't just finish it. She graduated magna cum laude, top of her class, gave it her all, and became a social worker so she could help families who had children with disabilities. Her first child, my sister, was born with brain damage. She wanted to help other families who had children like that. She always felt like she didn't have enough education, learning, training to help her daughter. So that degree was her way of trying to give back. I'm perplexed by a lot of things. I often wonder how I did it all. <laughs> I moved her four times, often with the help of my amazing brother. He was a huge help helping to move those big items. But packing up all of her stuff and selling all the furniture that wasn't going to fit into the new assisted living floor plan and 
getting rid of the old stuff and buying the new stuff and somehow making that all work. <laughs> one of my favorite memories from that is I found one of those flatbed little platforms on wheels and I put her lift chair on that flatbed thing and I rolled it down the street three blocks on the regular normal street <laughs> because her apartment was only three blocks down the street and I couldn't get it in the car any other way. So there we go, off on the road. There I am, me pushing a chair down the highway. <laughs> Quite a funny moment, actually. Hmm. I'm also pretty perplexed. My goodness sake, my mom, sweet little five foot three and, and stuck in a wheelchair 100% of the time. Man, could that amazing lady just destroy things. Anything I gave her, she just destroyed. <laughs> glasses. I actually started buying her two glasses, two sets of eyeglasses at a time, knowing that the one pair I gave her was going to be destroyed in a matter of weeks. And then I could just swap them out because I knew that the one wasn't going to last very long. And it's so funny because a few weeks before she passed, I looked at her glasses and they were again all destroyed. And I had the replacement frames with me. I was so proud of myself. I said, I'll, I'll just fix that for you, mom, right now. Plop, plop. I took out the lenses, put them in the new frames. They're all set to go, mom. There you go. <laughs> that was a win. My planning ahead finally paid off once. <laughs> but yeah, mom was really good at destroying things. She would destroy books, telephones, furniture, dishes. You name it. She just knew how to get rid of things. <laughs> I don't know how she did it, but she did. She just destroyed things. I'm so grateful for accessibility tools like Apple iPhones have, which allowed me to talk to mom in the last few weeks of her life, six months really of her life. I couldn't be there, obviously, right with her in her facility every single day. And I couldn't really call her because they didn't have phones in the rooms. So she needed to have a cell phone, but she didn't have any feeling in her hands. So she couldn't feel the screen and her eyesight wasn't good enough to be able to touch the right buttons. But the iPhone has this beautiful accessibility thing that allowed the phone to automatically answer after a number of rings that I set up. And it would automatically answer in FaceTime mode so I could see into her room. Now, I had to set this up, and obviously, I got permission from mom, so everything was all good. But when the phone would ring, I could see her little head over in the back of the room, and I'd yell as loud as I could, Mom, it's me, it's Lisa, come over to the phone. <laughs> I was so grateful for that. I got to check on mom on a regular basis almost every day. Those accessibility tools were incredible. That never would have worked if mom had to somehow pick up an iPhone and tap the right button. I'm really proud of how much joy my mom brought to other people just by being content and kind and joyful, silly and kind of goofy. She just made the world better in every way she could for those that were around her. And I'm really grateful that she was not a complainer. You know, when the time came to take her car away or to move her into assisted living, I think her response was, oh, I don't have to cook. And someone else will clean for me? I'm in. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah, she was pretty easygoing. And I know from stories from friends of mine that not every parent is. And so I'm really grateful that mom made that really easy for me. She was just content. Happy to have somebody else handle all the complexities and just listen to her books on tape and write in her journals and yeah. I'm perplexed being a caregiver that the MS Society the Multiple Sclerosis Society, and all the fundraisers that they have claim to be looking for a cure, but it seemed like the money that they raise is just lining somebody else's pockets, and that's angering. That's really angering. I rode in the MS-150 for four years, five different rides, raised a lot of money, and all of that money, I think, is just going for medicine. You know, Western medicine approaches to trying to solve this disease, but there are people out there reversing MS with nutrition and the change of environment and not using all of these really highly toxic drugs. And while sometimes those drugs are really wonderful, 
I just get so angry that we're not looking at things like nutrition and movement and ways that we can heal by giving our bodies the tools that they need to heal. So I stopped doing MS 150 rides. And just in case this came out sideways, I want to just say, I know drugs have a place. Prescriptions help a lot of people, especially in an acute situation where you need help quickly. But I don't know of any prescription drug that heals anybody. So that's the piece that I have a problem with. Maybe one of the biggest lessons that mom taught me and that I'm most grateful for is just how short life is. And that our guarantee of health is non-existent. We can lose our faculties, our ability to see or hear or feel or touch or smell at any moment. And I'm grateful that I learned that lesson early in life. And because I learned that lesson early that, gosh, any moment my health could be taken from me, I climbed the bell towers and I went to the countries and explored the places that I could explore and tried to take advantage of every opportunity that laid itself before me. You know, run the race, try the sports, go out for the basketball team, do the things that you can do while you can still do them. Don't wait till retirement. (laughs) How many people have waited for retirement and then not had a body that was able to travel like they expected it might be? So I want to eat well and sleep well and move well and be mindful of my life impact and what are things I'm doing to impact my health. And I'm grateful that I'm able to now use my platform and my passions to help other people find health and improve their health and be encouraged by not only health, but the relationships and all the other things that make us healthy. Our bodies are so intertwined. We're like a big old domino set up. And when you've got broken friendships or broken relationships, that affects our bodies and our health. I'm really grateful for the way my mom's health and her situation has opened my eyes to some of those things. I get to be my own power of attorney, my own healthcare agent. And I want to teach people how to be that for themselves so they can make great decisions that they feel like they own and that they're not just a cog in the system. I'm really grateful for how many lessons I've learned by being able to be my mom's caregiver. I'm grateful for the strength that I've had from God. Grateful that my Lord and Savior Jesus carried me more times than I will ever know because I could never have done this without him. In the end, being a caregiver is full of a lot of blessings, a lot of burdens, but overall, it's a gift. And I hope if you are in that position of being a caregiver, that you'll be able to step back and look at all of the things that you are doing that are a gift. And what you're doing for that person, the child that you're helping or the parent that you're helping or the grandparent or the friend that you just know that that is a gift to be able to be in those spaces and stand in the gap for that person who is really needing you. To wrap up this episode, I want to read my mom's eulogy and the poem that I wrote for her in her honor. Mom. Mom loved Jesus. She loved turtles and journaling. Every day, she loved being a mom. She loved poetry, music, books on tape, nickel slot machines, and really any contest she thought she might win. She loved birds, her pony, Goldie, turtles, writing, playing Scrabble on her iPad, loved her Bible, and reading God's Word. She loved the idea of brandy. She didn't drink it. But she loved the idea of it. Whenever you asked her what kind of a special thing she'd want, she'd say brandy, but she never drank it. She loved chocolate chip cookies and chocolate pudding and really anything chocolate. Oh, yeah. And mom loved turtles. (laughs) She always said they moved at her pace. (laughs) Mom had a peace, a deep peace from knowing and having a close relationship with Jesus Christ. Each night, she told me she would crawl into bed And she'd look up at this picture she had over her bed of a smiling Jesus. And she would say she knew he was holding her all night long. That's a peace that passes 
all understanding. Conversation with mom in the last few months was more difficult, but with questions. Oh, and she'd love to chat. So I came and we started talking about her life from the very beginning. She told me about being adopted at age four from the foster home in Minneapolis near, near Lake Calhoun. She told me about growing up in Bloomington and the many places she lived since her father was a home builder and they were always moving because he'd build a home and they'd move and they'd build a home and they'd move. And you know, in those final days, she sat and she could tell me every single address that she lived at, including the zip code. <laughs> West Bloomington was where she rode her pony Goldie and where the whole family got to catch Goldie when it got loose. <laughs> West Bloomington was also where mom drove her little white Red Cross Jeep that had that red plus logo kind of sloppily painted over with white paint. West Bloomington was where most of her early memories were, but it was Mankato State where my mom met her husband and my father, Jim. My mom sat and told me about when she met my dad how she liked him at first and how he met her parents kind of early on in their dating relationship, but they loved him immediately because he was so charismatic and so impressed that he drove a white Porsche and that he had served already so many years in the Air Force and he was an impressive man. I think it's interesting to consider the memories that our brains retain. Rarely are they memories that we think that we're going to remember, but rather they're like the obscure things or maybe Maybe the happier moments we remember, but I don't know why mom remembered the things she did in those conversations. She, she didn't talk much about Mona, my sister, or about her death at age six. She didn't talk about the years that she volunteered with the degree of honor or the MS society that she liked spending so much time with and going to the camp events. She didn't talk much about her divorce or being diagnosed with MS or the major change that she made when she moved herself, myself, and my brother up to be closer to her parents, which was a three hour drive away. She didn't talk about meeting her friend and companion of 25 years or about going back to school. She drove three to four times a week, an hour and a half to get to college classes, three to four times a week. And as I said earlier, graduated magna cum laude. She didn't talk a lot about turtles, but she didn't really need to. We could see them. She had hundreds of them. It was a collection that definitely took off. One of those self-evident things. But the thing mom did that was probably most impactful and made the biggest difference in this world were just those little things she did every day in difficult circumstances. She never complained, even though she had really good reason to. In fact, watching her struggle with MS most of my life I think I only saw her break down from frustration and anger toward her situation maybe once or twice. She always had a smile to share and always seemed content. And she made everybody's day around her just a little bit better. That was a great lesson to learn from her. I'll miss my mom's joy and her easygoing attitude and her silliness. But the reason I can celebrate her life with such peace and gratitude is because I know she's in heaven. I know she had a relationship with Jesus. And scripture tells us that we get a new body in heaven, so I know she's no longer strapped and held back by the difficulties her earthly body had with MS. How do I know she's in heaven? Well, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. She did this. She called on the name of the Lord. And Philippians 3.21 is how I know she's going to get a new body, or has a new body now, because it says in Philippians 3.21, that Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That's good news. <laughs> really good news, actually. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, mom was a writer and a poet, actually. She used to write a poem a day just to keep herself in the habit of writing. 
And so in her honor, I wrote one final poem for Ma Turtler. And it goes like this. The turtle is a curious creature. They are mysterious and slow. They lumber along in a thoughtful way, wherever they choose to go. Older than most everything, the turtle has seen it all. For more than 100 million years, they've just been here, having a ball. Mom loved turtles, she always said, because they move at her speed. But they are alike in other ways. Maybe you'll agree. The turtle has a tough outer shell, which keeps it safe and sound. Nothing seems to bother it. It just loves to hang around. I'm good at doing nothing. It's something mom would often say. I'm happy just to be here, she'd add. But seeing you makes my day. The turtle is quiet and sweet like that, resourceful and content. Mom definitely had that attribute. Some say she was heaven sent. Slow and steady, Mom's race is done. By trusting God, he saw her through. While Mom loved turtles here on earth, in heaven, she'll want to see you. Mom is free and healthy now with no MS to tether her dreams. She can run and laugh with Jesus with the smile that always beams. Someday, I'll go to heaven too. And when I see her there, she'll say, I'm happy just to be here, but seeing you makes my day. I'll see you in heaven, Mom. I love you. you.